I still don't have anything to say. Welcome to church. We are so glad that you're here because this church is much more than just a building. It's a family committed to loving God and loving people. This church is a safe place for anyone and everyone. No matter who you are, where you came from, or what you look like. Because at this church, we believe that God is many things. But most of all, God is love. And he has called us all to share his love with everyone. Welcome to church. Good morning, Connections Church. How's everybody doing this morning? Would you stand as you're able and we'll start with an opening prayer. Loving God, call us together as your people. Transform us with your love. Transform our hearts that we may love generously. Transform our eyes that we may see your grace. 
Transform our hands that we may serve others. Transform our spirits that we may be the body of Christ, gathered to worship and sent out to serve. Amen. praise in this house this morning.
Good morning, church. Good morning, everyone. You may be seated. It's so good to be back with you all after a couple weeks of being gone. We missed you. We're so, and we're so excited about all the new people who joined the church. Yay! We're excited about that. So, sorry to have missed that, but really good to be back with you this morning. Um, as we enter into this time of prayer, I do want to acknowledge just the suffering that's going on in the world around us, especially in Turkey and Syria. My son and his ranger bat were over in Syria for about a year, and it was really rough. It was really, really rough even before the earthquake. So um, I just think want to keep them um, in our prayers this morning as well as the things that are going on in the local community. There is so much need in the world, and it can be a little bit overwhelming, but it's wonderful to serve a God that knows and sees and can act himself and can direct us in how to act um, and help alleviate suffering and share his love. And so I wanted to share some thoughts with you that God brought together with me this week related to that. I know many of you probably do Jesus Calling in the morning and love how that kind of reorients the perspective for the day and gets me back on track with him. But I had never um, uh, thought of the scripture of Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 related to uncluttered. But um, I was thinking about Sunday and then the, the scripture um, hit me in a whole new way um, yesterday. Um, as it says, so then with endurance, let's also run the race that is laid out in front of us, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let's throw off any extra baggage, get rid of the sin that trips us up, and fix our eyes on Jesus, faith's pioneer and perfecter. He endured the cross, ignoring the shame for the sake of the joy that was laid out in front of him and sat down at the right hand side of God's throne. Think about the one who endured such opposition from sinners so that you won't be discouraged and you won't give up. And I was pondering that verse in light of being uncluttered, and I was thinking about the metaphor of the runner. <laughs> and um, I trained with a guy who ran the Emerald City Marathon in Portland uh, for a bit. Yeah, really, I know. But um, he, <laughs> he was telling me little things like, you know, you find the lightest, smallest pair of shorts that you can find. And you don't even want to wear a shirt, so you don't want a runner's number. And so you use the grease pen to write that on your leg. And you don't carry water. You get it at the station as you go by. And when you run, you don't run with this so that they're heavy and you're carrying something. You run like you're holding a light potato chip. <laughs> you don't want to crumble the potato chip. And so I was thinking about that related to this verse and being uncluttered and how critical it is that we are uncluttered so that we can run when something happens around us so that we can respond and we're not bogged down by things that God doesn't want us to be bogged down to. So as we enter into this time of prayer this morning, you maybe just want to consider, consider that idea that what, it, what, 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 is, what, does it need, what does it mean to be able to run the race that God set before you and how can you unclutter to be able to do that and serve those around you? Okay, well, um, recite the Lord's Prayer now together, and please feel free to do that in whatever language is most comfortable to you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Ruth and the children are going to come up now.
This next one is uh, new for us here at Connections, um, but it's been around a little while, and it's by uh, an artist called John Mark McMillan. And you may have noticed a few of his songs kind of creeping up uh, since I took over as the worship arts director here at Connections. Um, and his lyrics and music have just meant a lot to me in my spiritual journey the last five, six years. So I'm excited to share uh, another piece called Future Past. You hold the reins on the sun and the moon Like horses driven by kings You cover the mountains, the valleys below With the breath of your mighty wings Treasures of wisdom and things to be
time's true. You are the beginning and the end. One last time, you are the beginning. You are the beginning and the end. Amen, indeed. I think this calls for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, so grateful for the wonderful blessing, this wonderful gift that you've given to us, that we can get up, that we can go to a building, we can show up and, and we can meet you here. And this is the promise that we hold on to, that you are the beginning, that you are the end, and you hold all things in between. And right now, you, the great I am, you are in this place by the power of your Holy Spirit. So Lord, I just pray now that every man, woman, and child who gathers here that came out to worship you would be touched, would be moved, that you would speak to us, that you would impress upon us maybe a word of encouragement, maybe a kick in the pants. Give us what we need that you might make us and shape us and mold us more and more into each person you want us to be so that we are fully equipped by your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the mission that you've given to us to truly go out and to be your people. Because as we've already prayed, as we've already paused to recognize, in this world there is still much suffering, pain, heartache, and hurt. But we are a people that stand in the hope of your resurrection and the promise of your return. And therefore we can go out and we can spread good news. I pray that the good news lands on each and every person here this morning. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hey, friends, we are going to round the corner and finish up our uncluttered series today. Uh, next week, I'm looking forward to just sharing some things about our mission as a church moving forward. It's just going to be kind of a call back to some of the essentials, the foundations of what we want to be about as a community of faith following Jesus. And then, believe it or not, we're going to be into the Lenten or Easter season. Super excited to kick that guy off with all of you. we got a lot of things in store that are already in the works, and uh, you're going to be blessed by it. I know that for sure. Um, but the Uncluttered series... As we wrap it up, I pray it's been a blessing in your life. It's been a blessing in my life. Uh, the, the stated purpose is pretty clear. An uncluttered life is a life that has space. Space for the things that we say matter most, but those things that so often get pushed off to the sides. Space for God. Space for the relationships that we want to nurture in our lives. Space to be able to go out and serve and be the hands and the feet of Jesus out into the world. I hope that this spiritual journey has kind of paralleled maybe a physical journey for you. We've actually gotten a lot of donations at the church as people took the Uncluttered series as an opportunity to literally unclutter your lives. Very grateful for that. There are many um, homeless guests that we've served that are now walking around in jackets of yours and shoes of yours. <laughs> and shirts of mine, and uh, it's been kind of fun to see that. Um, so what a hoot. The spiritual implications, let me just recap them super quick. Of course, we began with wanting to reinforce the uncluttered image of God on each and every one of us, that image that has been marred by sin, but we know that can be cleansed and set free through the uh, gift of uh, Jesus Christ in our lives. We talked about confession which is nothing more, nothing less than agreeing with God, saying the same thing as God. And there's a power, of course, in naming it and saying it and getting it off of our chest, getting it out there, and then to know that we are assured forgiveness. Uh, then we talked about uh, taking off the old garment and being able to put on the clean new garment of Jesus Christ. And then last week, uh, that's, a, like, that's again one of my favorite passages, and uh, sorry I got all overly excited and preached long on that, but I just love that call um, to give our bodies and worship, to have the transformation of our minds, to step into and then know the very will of God for our lives, and we can do that in an uncluttered way. 
And now today's sermon actually caught me a bit by surprise, and it was inspired by some art. So we are going to first look at, let me get my guy going here. That's working today. Um, so Robin drew that. Isn't she a great artist? Yes, she is. She's awesome. So the women's Bible study, they do some art journaling. They don't just power through text. They take time to really go deep into the Word of God. And one of the ways they do that is they journal, they draw, they meditate upon the Word of God. And this was inspired by Robin from a passage in Ezekiel that talks about God taking a heart of stone and making it again a heart of flesh. What I wanted to zero in on today with you, though, is where that wisdom is picked up upon in the book of Proverbs. And we're going to land on verse 423. Uh, but I want to read for you the broader context of the passage. And again, this is God's wisdom. So this is wisdom for all of us who are willing to hear it. Here's what God's word says. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. And so that's what we're about to do right now. This is where God says, I'm about to drop some knowledge on y'all, and if you're willing to hear it, it could change your life. It could change everything for you. And here it is. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. Say, guard your heart. Thank you so much. I do love it when you participate with me. It just lets me know that you are engaged still. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do. This is a big, bold statement. Everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Ouch. Yeah, maybe convicting already for some of us. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. You gotta love that image of the path, staying on the path. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the left or to the right. Keep your foot from evil. This is the word of God. Amen, amen. It's a big, bold statement, of course, that everything you do, every thought, Every word translated into every action, it has a starting place. And that starting place the scripture points us to is the heart. Now, of course, we're already stepping into the spiritual here. We might be able to apply a a biological interpretation. Oh, the heart is actually a big muscle in this point. No, no, no. no. The center of your being, the heart, the soul, your, your core self, everything that you do is going to flow from this. Now, this is what Jesus had in mind whenever he had an interaction with some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And I'm going to tell you this story, uh, and then we're going to dive into a process of examining and then guarding our heart. But Jesus is doing a ministry in the region of Galilee, and he's stirring up a lot of controversy uh, and interest, as Jesus' ministry did. And in that context, a delegation comes down from Jerusalem to investigate to Jesus, it would seem. And they get down there, and they kind of get in the vicinity of Jesus. Maybe they kind of came down, and they listened to him preach a sermon or watched him perform some miracles. And then here's what they said. They said, Jesus, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders, and they don't ceremonially cleanse their hands before they eat? Now, here's the thing. We might get fixed on the second part. Ooh, they didn't wash their hands before they ate. That is kind of gross. We know better, but don't get hung up on that because they were actually more concerned with the first part of that statement. Why are they breaking from the tradition of the elders? During the course of God's redemptive history, bringing people, bringing forth a people, bringing that people through slavery, bringing that people into the promised land, then they find themselves in an exile again because of unfaithfulness. But after that exile, about 400 years prior to this interaction with Jesus, the people of God are allowed to start immigrating back into the promised land from the land of Babylon. And as they were coming back into the land of Babylon, they were reinstituting temple worship. God was to be worshipped in the temple, but the temple was supposed to represent the 
presence of God with the people. And we know, and we won't go too deep into this, but we know that there would come the day when the temple curtain would be torn and we would all have access to the presence of God. But this, in the context, in the time, it was very significant that they were setting up the temple worship and the presence of God amongst the people once again. And in that temple worship, they were very concerned with keeping the law. Now, the law was so precious, was so important, it represented so much of God's work with the people that they became just, just fastidious and fixated on being a people marked by keeping the law. And one of the ways that they did that is they began to set up traditions that would help them to keep the law. Okay, you gotta stick with me now again. They're gonna set up traditions that were going to help them to keep the law. It's, it's, it's sort of like whenever you get mad at your kids for saying a mildly bad word because you wanna protect them from saying the really bad words or things like that, right? You know, so, so they wanna set up these kind of boundaries, these protections, these brackets, these guards around the law. For example, it is the law of God to keep the Sabbath. And doesn't that sound horrible and oppressive and awful that we'd be given such laws, such, such, you know, such commands as God to keep a Sabbath? Except that in the context of the people of God, they were slaves for generations and generations and slaves. So the law to not be a slave and to have a day of rest and to worship God is freedom, right? The context of that is freedom. That wasn't set up for God. God wasn't a slave. God wasn't oppressed. God didn't cease to be God. No, no, that law was given for the people, for their freedom, for their blessing. We always have to keep that in, we always, we, we, you know, we, we just fall into that trap of every law, every boundary, every bracket is trying to save me from something fun. You know, that's why my parents had all these rules. They're always trying to keep me from fun. No, kids, your parents are trying to help you. God is trying to help us. So they really wanted to keep the Sabbath holy. And one of the ways that you kept the Sabbath holy is he said, well, just if you make somebody do work, if you make them go to business, they're not having a day of rest. And then he said, oh, so how about we do this? You can't touch money because if you touch money, you might do business. And if you're doing business, you might break the Sabbath. So does that make sense? It makes sense. There's a context, there's an understanding. There's a way that the law works. There's a way that the tradition worked. There's a way that it all makes sense. And it works until it stops working, right? Things work until you lose the context. You lose the importance. You lose the understanding of why it was all instituted. And then Jesus gets to the point, for example, where they're so fastidiously keeping these traditions and these rules that he just says, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not forget that man wasn't made for the Sabbath. You weren't created to honor the Sabbath. The Sabbath was given for you men and women that you might not be slaves anymore. Brilliant, right? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant on Jesus's part. Well, these guys, back to the story now, these guys are all worked up because they aren't doing this ceremonial washing of hands. And then Jesus calls them out on it. And he says, you know, it's not what comes into a man's mouth or a woman's mouth that makes them unclean. It's what goes out of the mouth. And he was definitely addressing some of the rules of kosher food and things like that. And, um, and that actually just says this, and then he walks away. And they were very offended. <laughs> and then so Jesus and his disciples, in the context of the story, uh, they're like, Jesus, could you, could you unpack that a little bit more for us? Like, I'm not... You're on to something, you've been on to something. We know you're really smart. Help us to understand this. And you gotta love Jesus' response to that is, are you still so dull? And um, let's, not, let's not forget that they wrote this of their own accord. If Jesus called me dull, I might not include that in the storytelling of my life, but praise be to the God to the disciples. They're like, yeah, he, he, you know, he called us dull sometimes. So are you still so dull? Um, and then he says, uh, you know, it's not what, goes into a man's mouth. It's, it's what comes out that makes him unclean. And then he keeps pushing into that example and says, you know, we know the food isn't going to make us unclean. You know, it's kind of the, the coming out process that is the uh, unclean part. And they're like, whoa, whoa, like we're not supposed to go to the bathroom anymore. And no. And that's why, again, he's like, you're still so dull. So we won't get fixated on that. And he says, well, let me just break it down for you. 
all of this stuff, like the Proverbs is teaching us, are coming from the heart. And that's the reflection of the true person. Let me just read this. So he says this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 20. Uh, it won't be on your screen. I'm just going to read this part for you. He says, so he went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. It's what's coming out of the person that God's going to look at and say, that's either holy or unholy. That's a blessing or that's like a defiling curse. He says, for from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. And then he goes through this list. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, arrogance, folly. All these things come from within and defile a person. Ouch. Have you heard of the seven deadly sins? I like the seven deadly sins. Don't misquote me on that. It's not that I like the seven deadly sins. Well, there is a part of me that likes the deadly sins. Because there's a part of all of us that likes to dabble in the deadly sins. And that's why they're called the deadly sins. I actually really like what Calvin Professor Rebecca uh, DeYoung says, the glittering vices. They're not sins like, ooh, they're nasty, they're ugly. They're glittering vices because we think, oh, wouldn't it be nice to just dip my toes into a bit of that gluttony? Wouldn't it be nice just to enjoy a little bit of that lust? Ooh, that nursing, that envy, just uh, something about that can feel good for a while. But that's why they're deadly. They sneak up on us. They take hold of us. And then they turn on us. They betray us. They don't provide what they were promising. And instead of bringing us life and blessing and wholeness and health and beauty and peace, that's when they get sinful. That's when they get ugly. That's when they become these vices that begin to rot us from the inside. How? So here's what we're going to do, friends. I've preached a whole series on the seven deadly sins, minus gluttony. I've been called on, on, on that. So someday I owe you, Heather. Um, we're going to do a quick inventory of the seven deadly sins here. And kind of like we did when we started the series, you're just going to do an inventory of your life. This has been a little bit different than my normal preaching style twice in this series, but I think it's a good exercise, and I've just been playing with it a bit here. Um, if I talk about these seven deadly sins, uh, well, I'll say this. If everyone, you're like, yep, checks that box, ooh, maybe we should talk. Because um, <laughs> chances are you're going to hear some of these, and you're going to be like, mm, mm not me. Well, good. I hope you're not held captive to every one of these sins. But I think if you're honest with yourself, there's going to be one, two, maybe three that you're going to be like, yeah, that's, uh, yeah that, that, that's one of them. That's the one I've been nurturing that for a while. And maybe this is the time for me to just to put those brackets around my heart and to guard my heart a little bit and to root out a bit of this glittering vice from my life. So that's your task. As I talk about this, if one of them doesn't sort of resonate with you, praise be to God, thanks be to God, you know, you're kind of steering clear of that one. But for that one that feels like I'm intruding upon your life, well, it's not me. <laughs> this is the wisdom of Jesus. Because again, the seven deadly sins is that list of sins that Jesus talks about. I'm going to deal with them in alphabetical order. I hope that helps you memorize them. I would commend you memorizing them. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about envy. We're going to talk about gluttony. We're going to talk about greed. We're going to talk about lust. We're going to talk about pride. And if we have time, we're going to talk about sloth, but I might not have enough energy at the end. So you see what I, you see what I did there? You see? Okay. Anger. Every one of these, by the way, is associated with an animal because the deadly sins kind of represent that animal instinct sometimes we might call it in each one of us anger the bear don't poke the bear anger takes many different faces and forms everything from the explosive anger that everybody lives in fear of if you're the dad you're the boss you're the coworker, you're the person who's just ready to fly off the handle anger can also be quietly seething underneath the surface but if we scratch anger, what we most often find, what we most often find is loss. Something has been taken away. It's Valentine's Day. Maybe that's why I always love this image of this heart so much. He or she broke my heart. 
you lost that love and you're angry about it. Maybe some of you lost your innocence at a young age because somebody took it from you. Maybe somebody lost your reputation because of what schoolmates or coworkers or somebody said about you. Maybe you lost an opportunity because somebody was deceitful. Somebody didn't play by the rules and they took advantage of you and you lost that position. Many times our anger stems from that place of loss in our lives. And here's what we need to say about that loss in our lives. It was wrong. It was not what God would intend for a world of shalom, a blessing of peace. It was wrong of that other person. But here's the thing. You are now double wounding yourself by nurturing that anger in your life. And that's the shame of it all. You were wronged and now you're living in the wrong of nurturing and anger that wasn't yours to begin with. So there is a solution to anger, as we'll dive into with each of the deadly sins of these glittering vices. And the solution to the anger is forgiveness. Forgiveness, as simple as that sounds, forgiveness as hard as that is to do. Because true forgiveness is one of the hardest works of any life. The work of forgiveness through Jesus Christ was the hardest work of his life. It cost him the cross and the angry jeers of those people, but it won for us salvation. My plea to you, my people, save yourself from the sin of anger. Maybe not even for them, but for yourself and how it's eating you alive. Extend forgiveness. The other deadly sin that can creep into our lives, the next deadly sin that can creep into our lives, is envy, the green-eyed monster, the dog. With this one, I was like, why is the dog envious? And then I visited some folks this week, and they had a dog, and the dog was all over me, and then I came home smelling like that dog, and I realized, oh, this is why they call envy the dog, because my dog was all like, hoo, 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 and there's like, I mean, literally, for like 10 minutes, he was like, I can't, I can't believe you. I can't, you leave this house and you hang out with another dog. You're the dog. I mean, I was like, oh yeah, this is why the dog is envious. Like my dog is literally so mad about that. Anyways, envy, envy, we can, envy, oh, envy is strong. Envy is the sin of the sisters of Cinderella with all her grace and beauty and charm. Envy is the sin of Soleri who looked at the gifts of Amadeus and just couldn't live with him anymore. Envy is the sin of Cain looking at the offering of Abel and he can't live with it. Envy is the sin of Saul when he saw the pass the, 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 the right of kingship going on to young David. Oh, envy just gets a grip on us because of their beauty, their gifts, their opportunities, their talents. Why didn't I get that? Why didn't God give that to me? Why is my older sister the one with all the talent? Why is my younger brother the one with all the, oh, we just let envy start to rot our lives. But there is a solution to it, and it's celebration. The wisdom of the ancients tell us that whenever you see envy creeping in on your life and you want to take from that person, that gift, that blessing, that beauty that is theirs, you need to turn on that and you need to celebrate it. You need to celebrate their beauty. You need to celebrate their gifts. You need to go to that person whose job you wanted and didn't get and you need to congratulate them and say, I'm gonna pray that you are going to thrive in this role. It turns on you to go to, yeah, I've, I've been, I, I, maybe I'll admit this for the first time, this, 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 I've actually done this this past year. Whenever I turned 50 uh, this past year, and for the first time in my life, I started taking some music lessons to try and learn guitar and to learn to sing. And now I hate Kellen. Oh, I hate him all the more. Cause I'm like, this is so hard. None of this comes natural to me. So Kellen, I celebrate your gifts and that you can do things I'll never be able to do, and Ricardo and Van, oh, you're so good, what? No, but that's the thing. We, when we see this green-eyed monster welling up, no, celebrate the gift in the other person. And then you share, then you share in the blessing and the beauty 
Okay, the green-eyed monster. Celebrate and don't let it get a hold of you. Uh, gluttony. Gluttony is pretty obvious on the surface. Food is a gift. We need food to live. Uh, the Bible starts with a garden where food is abundant. The Bible ends with a table where saints feast forever with Jesus. In between, we have a table where we actually experience communion with God. Uh, food, I mean, who doesn't like food? Food is awesome. Food is essential to life. This is one of the tricky ones, though, but food can take too much of a priority and presence in our lives. Three really simplistic ways that we can be uh, fall victim to the sin of gluttony. One is the first one, the obvious one, just too much. There is the gluttony of too much. The, the core of that is you're trying to fill a void that food can't fill. You're trying to suppress the loneliness. You're trying to suppress the you know, j j j just those, those deeper needs for love, for affection, for companionship, for something in your life. And you're like, I'll just stuff food into this spot and hopefully I'll feel better than in the end. That's kind of the obvious one. With sensitivity, the second one is the converse. We try to control food so much we fall into an eating disorder. And we say food is nothing. Food is the enemy. Food is evil. That is perversely a form of gluttony to not accept that we need this. It's a part of God's creation and it's right and it's good. Um, then, th then there's the, the third part is then food sometimes just becomes people's religion. It becomes their worship, becomes all things, all the time. Um, I, I read a little article years ago and it just always stuck with me because this is somebody kind of in the Hollywood glamorous circle. And he said, you go to these parties and everybody um, is on a new diet and a new system and uh, they're going into ketosis or they're going vegan uh, or they're going gluten-free, they're going something. And, and this person just reflected upon, it's kind of become the new religion in certain circles. It just, it will be, if I can get the right diet, it will save me. No, <laughs> Jesus saves, not hamburgers, <laughs> whatever. This cure to the sin of gluttony, we're going to talk a lot about in Easter and then Easter tide is fasting and feasting. God has a natural rhythm amongst the people of God where we go through seasons of fasting, where we let go of some things about food and diet, and we show that we are in control. And then here's the awesome part and then we go into seasons of feasting. And never forget, I like to point this out every year too, the fasting goes 40 days and then the feasting season goes 50 days. So that's pretty awesome. Thank you, Jesus. We'll talk more about that coming up. Okay, then there's, then there's greed. Greed. This one is characterized by frogs. I don't understand why frogs are greedy, but the greedy frogs. Uh, greed is the black hole that just keeps wanting more and more and more and keeps on consuming, and yet that void itself is never filled with stuff. But the true heart, the true pain, one of the worst things of greed, of course, is, is that real greed gets us whenever we don't just want the thing, we want to take the thing from somebody else because that's how we'll really be happy. It's like the little kid playing with a toy who's perfectly happy until he sees his sister's toy. Then, he, you know, he wants his sister's toy. And, you know, it's the, it's the guy who wants a bike, but he doesn't just want a new bike. He wants, you know, that other guy's bike. Uh, it, it's when you want to take it from somebody because you think part of the joy, part of the thrill, part of the need is somebody else can't have it. That's when greed really gets a hold of your heart. And the thing about greed, of course, greed is like the trust killer. Greed says, if I can get enough money, if I can get the car, if I can get the house, if I can get the stuff, then my life is taken care of. I am provided for. I have nothing to worry about. And that's the, law, the lie of greed is that it's stealing the trust and the faith that we need to have in God and God alone. And our God is generous with his gifts that he pours out. And so the remedy to the vice of greed in our lives is simply, and this one's pretty straightforward, generosity. Give it away. <laughs> Let it go. Give your first fruits to God in an offering of worship. Give over and above in gifts to the poor and to the needy and to the hungry. 
give generous gifts at Valentine's, buy flowers, buy candy, just gi give, give it away, give, let go. Say you don't own me, these possessions don't possess me, I'm just gonna let go of some stuff. Now, how far you need to go with that, I'm gonna let you work out with God. Some of us need to let go of a lot, like I'm holding on to a lot. And Jesus told the people who held on to a lot at some times, let's not forget this. I'm not gonna unpack this too much. I'll just let it land on you. He said, give it all away. <laughs> Hopefully for most of us, we don't have to give it all away, but chances are every one of us can give some of it away. So practice generosity. Don't let greed steal the trust that you need to give only to God. Okay, quick recap. We're just past the halfway point. We've talked about anger, we talked about envy, we talked about gluttony, we talked about greed. Now let's talk for just a little bit about lust. Lust is one of the more glittering of them for obvious reasons. And again, this is a sensitive topic and there's a lot of nuance we could say about this, except that lust has new ways of getting into our hearts and into our lives that the world hasn't faced before. Now we know, for many of us, it is literally one click of a button away. And we can indulge the images that we know will spark the endorphins and the dopamine and will give us that momentary thrill. And it's not just men in back alleys and seedy corners of the city. It's young kids, it's grown men, it's older men, and more and more it's young girls and grown women and older women. And you know why? Because it's normal and it's natural to look upon the image of God and the gift that is ourselves and to see something beautiful and desirable and wonderful about that. You're normal in so many ways if you fall victim to pornography addiction and lust. You're just normal but it doesn't make it right. We aren't just animals, we make decisions, we have a will, and we respect the image of God in ourselves and one another. And saying no to pornography and saying no to lust is a way that we respect the image of God in ourselves and others. And I'm just gonna say this, if you are struggling with this, you are part of the majority. <laughs> so don't feel like, you know, oh, I'm, I, quit beating yourself up and just ask for help. Ask me, ask a friend, ask somebody, get online, get a filter, get an accountability system. There are ways that we can protect ourselves and set up a guard against lust. And lust can tip and dip into other areas of life. Yes, we know, but this is the most obvious and direct one. And we know that ultimately the solution that we wanna aim all of our lives towards is fidelity in marriage and chastity and singleness. Fidelity in marriage and chastity and singleness has been the way of the people of God since the beginning. And it's the way that we have to keep pushing through and pressing upon people because it is the way of life that brings the most beauty and blessing to all people, all things considered. Right? We know that. We know that. We, this makes sense. Okay. Um, the next one is pride. The horse. Pride. Pride, pride isn't a healthy understanding and accepting of the image of God, that we are all made as children of God, that we all have gifts from God. We have a, you know, no, there's like, there's like the healthy identity of the Christian man or woman standing in Jesus Christ. That is a beautiful thing. No, pride is the arrogance. Uh, you know, it is the vanity. It is the conceit. Uh, it's the disdain. It's the looking down upon. I mean, they call it a horse because they would literally in these times, ancient times, be on their high horse looking down on the people and lording it over them. The solution to pride, because we've got around the corner here, is, of course, humility. Humble yourself before God. Humble yourself before one another. Model Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to be held onto with a death grip, but humbled himself and became obedient to his own death. We, we humble ourselves. And I do have a solution because that's still kind of, um, you know, that, that's abstract, humble yourself. One of the best ways that I know of to humble yourself is to continually serve the poor, to continually serve in shelters, to feed the hungry. 
um, to get yourself, to get to, um, to, to, to pull up to the corner with a person panhandling. And, and sure, maybe you give them something. I'm not going to judge that. People have different standards and things they live by with that. But ask them their name. Get to know them as a person. Get to know their story. And there's just something about it that brings you down. And you realize, I am no different than this man or this woman living on the street, dirty, smelly, homeless, and hungry. This person is a brother or sister. We stand on the same ground. There's something about just doing that ministry that just, it kills the pride in you. And I would commend it to all of you. And then the last one, never mind. Just kidding. No, sloth. So here, okay, sloth, the obvious, the obvious thing about sloth is just being lazy. And if you're just being lazy, stop it. Get up, set your alarm, go to work, do something productive. Go do something with your life. Sound like a dad? <laughs> Amen. I am. Um, sloth, in the interesting way, though, it can sneak up on you, though. Sloth, can, sloth is the sneaky one. And here's how the sneaky thing of sloth works. Oh, no, 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 I get up and I go to work and I work hard and I go to the gym and I exercise. No, 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 I'm not slothful. No, the sloth is that you never go home and work on your marriage. You never make the time to talk with your kids. You never set, a time, set aside time to serve. No, sloth is a sneaky one. Sloth is whenever you fill your life up with an industrious that you think makes you godly, but you are slothfully neglecting the most important things, perhaps, in your life. Yeah. And I, can, I can see people like, oh, I never thought. Yeah, that's, that's the wisdom of the ancients. They're like, no, no, no. It's not just being busy all the time. It's making sure you're putting energy to the things that matter most in your life. And that can be hard. I mean, th that can be hard. So, so we start doing that. Okay, band, get on up here. You're going to take us into a little bit of time of worship. And... As the band takes us into worship, here, here's what I'm just going to invite you to do. Hopefully, going over this list of seven glittering vices, these seven deadly sins, I pray if everyone, you're like, that's me, check that box. I'm prideful, I'm envious, I'm angry, I'm slothful, I'm, no, no. <laughs> but for that one that really pricked your heart, or maybe those two that you're like, yeah, I've been dipping into that, name it. There's power in naming it. There's always power in naming it. Name it. Say, God, I really could fall victim to the sin of greed. I know it. I'm naming it. I'm confessing it. And then work on the antidote to that. Again, if it's anger, work on forgiveness. If it's envy, celebrate the one you're envious of. If it's gluttony, just recognize how maybe that has taken a hold of your life and we're going to go into a season of feasting and fasting in the Easter time coming up shortly. If it's greed, give it away. If it's lust, that one I'm just going to say ask for help. Ask, confess it and ask for help with somebody. If it's pride, serving God always takes us down a notch. And if it's sloth, just determine you're going to start putting energy to those things that you know matter most. Let me say a prayer and that's going to wrap up our uncluttered series. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time with my brothers and sisters, and I pray for the brother or sister right now who knows that one of these glittering vices has gotten a hold of their heart. I pray you will give them the encouragement, the strength, the energy, whatever it is they need to protect themselves from this, that you will walk them through that and bring them to a better tomorrow and better days ahead, living free from these deadly sins and living into these wonderful virtues.
many people brought food to share. We're going to tip towards gluttony right now because I saw cakes and cookies and treats. I don't know where. Thank you so much for bringing. We're in for a party out there. Um, woo, yeah, then we'll confess and repent and all will be good. There's, um, amen. There's a bunch of good things going on. Um, pay attention for one more minute and check the box that applies to you and that you want to participate in. Uh, nobody signed up, but I will still run a membership class after worship today. Grab me. Uh, I've got materials. We'd love to talk to you about our mission. But because membership goes both ways, session one is me sharing some things about the church. Session two is you sharing what you bring to the church. So I think it's a beautiful thing. So we can do that. Let me know right after worship. There's the youth and young adults Super Bowl party today at the Roth's house. Murray, Barbara, you guys, you know, if, you, if you're youth or young adult, if, uh, whatever standard that is, you're invited. You can participate in that. Um, next, and then starting, yeah, next week, Sunday school teachers meeting. And then right after that, friends, here's just pay attention. We're going to have Ash Wednesday on February 22nd. That's going to lead us into our Lenten series. We're going to have a Lenten adult Sunday school class. Uh, so for six weeks after worship, we're going to be talking about some wonderful themes. And um, then we're going to have the Passion Play here on, 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 on less than a month now, March 5th. Good stuff going on. Guess what? It's all on the website. Check that out. It's all in the email that you should be getting. And if you're not, let me know and you'll start getting it. And then we cannot just be doing church together on Sunday. Let's go get gluttonous out there.